Okay, great. Bonjour, madame, monsieur. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our 2021 CG and Fellowship Convocation. My name is Marianne Walker, and I'm the chair of the college, college's board of directors. We begin by respectfully acknowledging that we're hosting today from the traditional territories in an ancestry lands of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. We invite you to take a moment to reflect on the cultural importance of these lands as we honor those who have walked before us along with those still to come and to reaffirming our commitment to forging culturally safe relationships on pathways towards reconciliation. Please join me in also acknowledging the indigenous culture of knowledge sharing that leverages collective experiences and allows people to learn from one another. It is in that spirit of mutual respect and collaboration that we come together today. I'm delighted to be hosting this virtual convocation alongside Alain Doucette, our president and CEO. It's a wonderful to join so many of you in its true honor to be here with you today. We'd like to welcome members of our board of directors, fellowship council, professional standards council, fellows, CHEs, chapter executive council, representatives of the Canadian forces who are in attendance today. We'd like to encourage participants to celebrate graduates through the convocation using Zoom chat feature. You can open your chat by clicking the icon found in the bottom panel of your screen. To ensure that everyone sees your message of support, make sure that you select all panelists and attendees in the drop down menu within the chat window. The process of going through the fellowship program is one that includes a rigorous peer review component. The process could not occur in such a rigorous and professional manner without the involvement of our members of the Fellows Council. It is this council that ensures on behalf of a professional association that new fellows have met the high standards for fellowship in the college. Thank you to all the members of the Fellowship Council for your valuable contribution and commitment to the college. The member the members of the Fellowship Council are shown on the screen. It is also very important to acknowledge the work of the College Fellows who actively participate as advisors and reviewers in the support of candidates in the Fellowship Program. I'd like to extend, extend a sincere appreci appreciation to all of you. Thank you so much. Le programme de fellowship et de CHELCS sont gérés par notre équipe du Bureau national. Merci pour votre travail acharné et vos contributions à l'évolution des programmes fellowship et CHELCS Select et à l'expérience de nos candidats. I'm very pleased to report that we have two fellows this year, John Roots and David Thompson. John Roots is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Catholic Health Alliance of Canada, which brings together the 14 sponsors and owners of 129 health care organizations with Catholic identity in Canada. John has held a variety of senior leadership positions which have taken him on a journey across the healthcare continuum. These various roles have focused on implementing strategy and leading major change initiatives. John holds an Honours Bachelor of Economics from Wilfrid Laurier University, a Master of Health Sciences from the University of Toronto. He is also a Certified Public Accountant, a Certified Health Executive, and a Fellow of the Executive Training for Research Application Program through the Canadian Health Services Research Foundation. C'est avec plaisir que je vous annonce que le Collège a deux nouveaux Fellows cette année, John Roots et David Thompson. John a occupé une variété de postes de cadre dirigeant dans tout le continuum des soins de santé. Ses divers rôles étaient axés sur la mise en œuvre de stratégies et la direction d'importantes initiatives de changement. John est actuellement le président directeur général de l'Alliance catholique canadienne sur la santé, qui regroupe les 14 organismes parrains et propriétaires des 129 organisations de santé de confession catholique au Canada. John est titulaire d'un baccalauréat spécialisé en économique de l'Université Wilfrid Laurier et d'une maîtrise en sciences de la santé de l'Université de Toronto. Il est comptable agréé, un leader certifié en santé et un fellow du programme Formation en recherche pour cadres qui exerce dans la, qui exerce dans la santé 
de la Fondation canadienne de la recherche sur les services de santé. I now invite John to turn his camera on to put on his fellowship medallion that was sent to him in advance of today's ceremony and to read the fellowship pledge. Thank you, uh, Mary Ann. I, John Ritz, in the presence of the members of the Canadian College of Health Leaders, do hereby pledge that as a fellow, I shall abide by the standards of ethical conduct and shall sustain my involvement in the college's affairs mensurate with the leadership role expected of a fellow. That's wonderful, John. Congratulations. Our second new fellow is David Thompson. David has been recently involved in the Canadian College of Health Leaders for many years. David has a CHE. He was a chapter chair for the BC Lower Mainland chapter of the college and served two terms as the BC director on the board of directors college. David received a college's national mentorship award in 2019, and he continues to be involved in the college as a CHE evaluator and as a member of the national mentorship award selection committee. David has held many leadership roles in the Canadian health system and has spent most of his career in British Columbia. He is currently an advisor for the pandemic planning for long-term care and assisted living with Fraser Health and a senior consultant with the Institute of Health System Transformation and Sustainability in Vancouver. David is an extra fellow and is currently completing a certification in digital health through the University of California in San Diego. David Thompson s'implique activement dans les activités du Collège canadien des leaders en santé depuis de nombreuses années. Il détient son LCS, il a été président du chapitre BC Lower Mainland et a été l'administrateur de la Colombie-Britannique euh, et euh, au, au sein du, collège du conseil d'administration du Collège pendant deux mandats. David a été le titulaire de 2019 du prix pour le mentorat au Collège. Il continue de servir en tant qu'évaluateur du programme CHE-LCS et de, et de, de membre du comité de sélection nationale des lauréats pour le prix sur le mentorat. David a occupé de nombreux postes de leader dans le système de santé canadien et a passé la plus grande partie de sa carrière en Colombie-Britannique. Il est actuellement un conseiller en planification des soins de longue durée et d'aide à la vie autonome en temps de pandémie à Fraser Health et consultant principal à l'Institut for Health Trans System Transformation and Sustainability à Vancouver. David est un boursier du programme Force et il termine actuellement un programme de certificat en santé numérique à l'University of California à San Diego. Terminé le programme de fellowship du CCLS constitue depuis longtemps un objectif de David et il est donc très heureux de recevoir son titre de fellow du Collège canadien des leaders en santé. I now invite David to turn on his camera to put on his fellowship medallion, which was also sent to him in advance of today's ceremony, and read the fellowship pledge. Thank you, Marianne. Merci beaucoup, Alain. I, David Thompson, in the presence of the members of the Canadian College of Health Leaders, do hereby pledge that, as a fellow, I shall abide by the standards of ethical conduct and shall sustain my involvement in the college's affairs commensurate with the leadership role expected of a fellow. Congratulations, Congratulations David, on receiving your, your fellowship. I had the privilege of working both with both of these healthcare leaders, and today is an exciting day for both of them. I'd like to now invite our college's Brenda Lamney, our Vice President of Professional Leadership Development, to make an exciting announcement. Thank you, Marianne. Hello, everyone. I'd like to take this opportunity to first congratulate all the new fellows and CITs for your remarkable achievement. The fellowship designation recognizes members who have demonstrated outstanding leadership, who have had an impact on the Canadian health system through their leadership and engagement, and who are motivated to continue to influence future leaders through their involvement in the fellows program and the CCHL. The Canadian College of Health Leaders is thrilled to be officially launching a redesigned fellowship program this week at NHLC called the Fellowship Select Program. 
The redesigned program includes three distinct eligibility and completion pathways. Each program track required to earn the designation focuses on impact, reflection, and knowledge translation. There are three tracks to the fellowship select program. The career track for leaders who have had a significant impact on the Canadian health system over the course of their career. The academic track for leaders who have completed graduate level research within the past five years or on health system improvement and or health system leadership. And finally, the CHE track for those leaders with their CHE, like yourselves, who have completed three health leadership specialties and two CCHL contributions over the course of their career. I invite you to watch a brief video about the Fellowship Select program. Thank you. Over to you, Marianne. Okay, great technology when it works. Um, so in 2019, the Canadian College of Health Leaders unveiled a revised version of its Certified Health Executive CHE program, the only Canadian professional designation available to all health leaders to adapt to and reflect to the constant changes in leadership needs within the Canadian health system. The revised program called the CHE Select was made available on our website on June 1st, 2019, and was officially launched at the NHLC 2019. Since its launch, the uptake of CHC Select has consistently surpassed historical milestones, recording highest monthly registration rates in each month for the last half year and a half. The growth of the CHC Select represents a growing network of engaged Canadian health leaders dedicated to lifelong learning, collaboration, and system improvement. CHE Select intensifies the college's role in supporting those leaders in the Canadian health system 
to divine and understand their leadership style and the role they play in leading system change. The revised program represents an extensive journey into leads-based leadership development using two tools, content and processes representing current best practices and evidence. Le langage commun du leadership offre le cadre leads aux leaders individuels et aux organisations du secteur de la santé dans tout le continuum des soins de la santé a le potentiel de les inspirer et de renforcer leur capacité de travailler ensemble dans le but de reformer le système de santé de manière à obtenir les meilleurs résultats possibles pour les patients et leurs familles. La pandémie a, parmi bien d'autres choses, fait ressortir le besoin absolu de leaders talentueux capables d'adaptation pendant de périodes marquées par la volatilité, l'incertitude, la complexité et l'ambiguïté. Nous avons vu les leaders canadiens du secteur de la santé s'adapter rapidement pour répondre aux besoins en constante évolution, collaborer dans le cadre de partenariats qui n'avaient jamais existé auparavant et innover presque du jour au lendemain pour adopter de nouvelles technologies. We are very proud of the role of, that the Canadian College of Health Leaders has played in supporting health leaders during the pandemic, including free virtual group coaching, webinars with senior leaders from a range of, se of sectors to help to share ideas and inform decisions, and being the hub of collaboration for members to connect and share experiences and resources. The college has also learned itself from the pandemic, validating thoughts, frameworks, and ideas so that we may share this knowledge with Canadian health leaders across the country and across the system. Dr. Jason Geertz will be presenting some of our findings and our research later in this session. The CHE program is overseen by the Professional Standards Council, which ensures high professional standards and continuous quality improvement for the professional designation program. Thank you to all members of the Professional Standards Council for a job well done. The Professional Standards Council is composed of certified members as listed on the screen. The CHE designation is an important professional recognition by the college. Today, we have the privilege and honor of introducing 191 of our newest certified health executives. The CHE designation identifies members who have demonstrated leadership and commitment to their profession and have successfully met all the requirements of the program. Pour être admise au programme CHE-LCS, une personne doit être prête à s'investir et doit avoir un parcours éducatif de l'initiative personnelle et des réalisations professionnelles qui répondent aux normes élevées exigées des leaders certifiés en santé. L'achèvement du programme représente un jalon très important dans la carrière de chaque candidate et chaque candidat. During 2020-2021, 191 of our colleagues have been granted the CHE designation. A list of the new CHEs is in your convocation booklet, which was distributed earlier via digital format and will also be shown on the screen. The recipients are divided into two groups for this ceremony, CHEs and CHEs from the Canadian Armed Forces. In alphabetical, alphabetical order per chapter, we now call on the following certified health executives, non-Canadian forces to be recognized.
Congratulations to all of our certified health executives on their achievement. The second group of CHEs consists of officers of the Canadian Armed Forces. Les services de santé des Forces armées canadiennes sont une composante du système de santé fédéral. Ils fournissent des soins et des services de santé à 100 000 membres des Forces armées canadiennes régulières et de la réserve dans deux contextes différents, au pays, ce qu'on appelle en garnison, et en déploiement. The forging of our long-standing and important alliance between the Canadian Armed Forces Health System and the College was an important step in recognizing leadership and management competencies within the military health domain. Dans le cadre de ce partenariat, le travail des Forces armées canadiennes a contribué de manière importante au succès du Collège de plusieurs façons. A Canadian Armed Forces representative serves on the College's boards, Board of Directors, currently Major General Marc Bilodeau, CHE. Les membres des Forces armées canadiennes sont encouragés à devenir des membres certifiés du Collège et de la certification CHE-LCS est un atout pris en compte lors des évaluations en vue de promotion. Nous sommes très heureux d'annoncer que plus de 85 professionnels de la santé des Forces armées canadiennes ont obtenu leur titre depuis 2003. Un chapitre virtuel, le chapitre Starlight, a été créé pour soutenir les membres du Collège faisant partie des Forces armées canadiennes. Over the years, this partnership has resulted in a positive impact for both the College and the Canadian Armed Forces. Please join me for a moment in a virtual acknowledgement to the long-standing partnership between the College and the men and women who serve in the Canadian Armed Forces. I'd like to invite Major General Marc Bilodeau, CHE, to recognize the new certified health executives from the Canadian Armed Forces. Merci, Alain. It is with great pleasure that I'm here today to recognize this year's Canadian Armed Forces recipients of the Certified Health Executive designation. Je suis très heureux d'être ici aujourd'hui pour reconnaître les nouveaux CHE, leaders certifiés en santé des Forces armées canadiennes. In alphabetic order, I now call upon our new certified health executives from the Canadian Armed Forces to be recognized. Lieutenant Colonel Rochelle Eud, Lieutenant Colonel Justin Keddy, Major Carolyn McWigan, and Lieutenant Vaisseau Sylvain Menon. The Canadian Armed Forces Health Services places immense value on the strategic partnership between our organization and our college. 
For almost two decades, the CHE has served as a touchstone for aspiring leaders in the military health system and is a preferred qualification for those who are chosen to lead our military units, as well as those who aspire to become institutional healthcare leaders within the Canadian Armed Forces. Beyond the foregoing, the opportunities that membership in the college provides to those of us in uniform for professional development, networking, and friendship are beyond measures. Please join me in congratulating these new certified health executives from the Canadian Armed Forces on their CHE achievement. Thank you, General Villado, and congratulations, all CHE. Navigating the various stages of the pandemic has showcased the crucial role that healthcare leaders play internationally and locally, as well as highlighting some key leadership lessons. It can be argued that there are in fact four pandemics, COVID-19, the social awakening in terms of systemic racism, long-term care crisis, and climate change. Balancing these and other competing priorities presents definite challenges and unprecedented opportunities to improve the health and lives of our staff, patients, and communities. The Canadian College of Health Leaders, Dr. Jason Geertz, will address key learnings from a year of ongoing research on leadership during a crisis as well as what we might carry forward in our leadership in year to come. Dr. Jason Geertz is the Director of Research and Leadership Development at the Canadian College of Health Leaders and Leeds Canada. Jason completed his PhD at the University of Cambridge on leadership for senior doctors, military officers, and other professionals. He's an honorary visiting fellow at the Business School of University of London, UK, and is an active researcher. His recent publications on leadership and leadership development has been featured in peer-reviewed journals, and he's currently writing a book with Dr. Amanda Goodell, an expert lead leadership. Jason's current research on leadership during the pandemic has been featured in the Global Mail, Hospital News, Local Radio, and CBC National News, as well as globally through the International Hospital Federation and the British Medical Journey Journal. Jason has served as an expert advisor to the Yale School of Medicine, University of Zurich Business School, and the National Health Services in the UK and the UK Defence Academy. He is currently a leadership instructor and program director at the Schulich School of Business and Executive Education in the Telfer Business School. Jason is also a qualified teacher and was nominated for the Toronto Stars Teacher of the Year. Welcome. Thank you very much, Marianne, and uh, welcome to all of you. This is my title slide. I, I have been in touch with the public health people, so I had to put the stay at home part into the title. The photograph on this title slide is my niece, Josie, age four. Her parents kept her home all year. And so this is my message today, both in terms of understanding how this year has been for her and also as leaders in the international and national communities, what are we gonna to do to make sure that the next year for people like Josie is gonna be better? So here we are, the title, Crises, Health Leadership, the Movie. So welcome to all of you who are being recognized as CEOs, uh, sorry, excuse me, as CHEs and fellows to the CEOs colleagues and families who have come out to support, welcome to you as well, and to the recently acquired household pets and under-stimulated neighbors who are eavesdropping, you are also welcome at this event. Thank you for dressing up your font on this occasion. It will be very helpful for me as we go along to gauge and adjust my performance according to the unwavering stalwart white font on the black background. Marianne, great. Second, I, I think it's important that we recognize that what we have achieved in the past year, that despite the most trying times, we've been resilient, we haven't given up, and we've really done our best to care for the people we are tasked to serve. And I think that together we have actually achieved quite a lot of remarkable things. And I think we should just start today from my part to recognize that, that what we have done together. Uh, look, I've been to a fair number of graduations, but not one of them from the comfort of my own living room. 
where you could covertly be wearing Care Bear slippers and nobody would know. And definitely not one where you could bring your own food and beverage, so I, I see you. Normally, you have to wear a full suit with fancy shoes, commute to the venue, really who does that anymore? Find parking, this is blockbuster video territory. There's a limited number of tickets, so now you can have as many people as can fit in your living room. Okay, that's pretty much the same. No air conditioning or heating, that's you, Thunder Bay. And your kid might be having a meltdown and you can't just put yourself on mute. You actually have to walk up and collect your diploma. Maybe you'll trip, maybe you won't. Embarrass your mom and say, it's just like elementary school. And then once you get home, you'll discover with horror that none of the photos your guests took of the event include all of your limbs, but most include at least one of their fingers that are holding the camera phone. So, can we just agree that we're actually doing pretty great here? So my, uh, my declaration is that I, I work on commission for this event, uh, not in the monetary sense, but if this sucks, if it's, if it's not a memorable part of your leadership journey, then I won't be asked back next year. So I needed to find a, an achievable barometer of success. And so my wish like for the guests, I hope you have a nice time. But for the health leaders, my wish is that you take a protected 20 minutes at some point after this event and reflect on the content and that you commit to improving one thing in your work to make it better. If you do that after this event, then I'll have, I'll have earned my commission. This is a, a photo from Mallorca that I took actually uh, just before sunrise. So we get a little glimmer of hope from the lighthouse and 20 minutes later, it was full daylight. You could see everything. So I have to say that I think Malcolm Gladwell got it wrong. This, this notion in Outliers that 10,000 hours makes you a master, I think is absolute nonsense, uh, near absolute. And the reason why I know it's nonsense is because I've, I've spent more than 10,000 hours in my career preparing and delivering public, speak, public speeches and, and this is my slide. <laughs> and, and, and this is like, you're getting my best stuff here. This is, I didn't kind of lower the bar just to make this point. So basically that 10,000 hours, it, there's an article that we're putting together for our, our journal, the forum on expertise and leadership. 10,000 hours gives you experience, but it doesn't give you expertise. So 10,000 hours playing a sport does not make you an Olympian, nor does it make you a medalist which is obviously evident by my frustration with the windmill hole at the mini pot, despite 10,000 hours of effort. And a few years ago at the Oscars, Lady Gaga, who's a rock star, obviously got up there and said, do you know what? Yeah, we won and it looks so glamorous and easy. And yet this is really, really hard work. This doesn't just happen by showing up or by just putting the time in. And that's why I'm so thrilled to work with Stefan and Brenda with the CHE program and the fellowship program because that program, those two programs are not focused on just putting the time in. They're designed based on evidence and best practice from literature and life, self-awareness through the 360 assessment process, plus formal leadership development, plus applying your leadership to your actual workplace to improve outcomes that those are key elements of what goes in to effective leadership. And so it's not just something that just comes naturally. It requires intentionality and hard work. And so it's such a privilege to join with you today. The 191 is just fantastic that you, you've made this commitment to making things better in your career for the lives of your team, families, and community. And so what we hear in, in our work day to day is that there are many employers who say the CHE designation is not only a preferred designation, but it really sets people apart, much like uh, for project managers, the PMP designation is something if you have two candidates and one has one, the respect they have for this credential would set those people apart. And, and we hear from many people that the CHE designation is the same. 
And so it, it's being seen as a differentiator. And my message today, we, we started with superheroes, we got to get away from that for a second, is that basically you being here today, your leadership day in and day out will be a testament to the process of the CHE and the fellowship and will be the kind of thing that will enable employers to say, yes, I understand this, I've seen it in action, and it really, really makes a difference. So I want to commend you for your work and also to remind you that this is having a real difference. <laughs> so as Marianne mentioned, at this event last year, we discussed that there are in fact four pandemics going on, the COVID-19 pandemic, the social awakening to systemic racism, <clears throat> long-term care could be argued as, as its own pandemic, which requires intentionality and prioritization, and Climate change has tried to sneak its way in there too, and I hope it gets more of the spotlight. At risk of overwhelming, there's a fifth without question that we were aware of a year ago, but has become even more prominent, and that is the mental health pandemic that some of which we're aware of now and much of its impact we're not fully aware of yet. And so a year ago, we said, here are the four pandemics. Now there's five. And what I wanna to do today is to reflect on how we've done to look back over this past year of health leadership in our work and in our lives and, and really gauge how have we done? Where have we gotten it right? Where do we need to fix it? And what could we do that's brand new that we've never done before? So we've also learned a few things in the last year. We've, there's some new terms that are, have become household words that we didn't necessarily have before, social distancing, PPE a year and a half ago, how many people knew that term? Unprecedented, my colleague Julie likes to point out that this is the unprecedented use of the term unprecedented. Uh, public health has become more prominent, a chief medical officer. Oh, you're on mute, at least once a meeting. The new normal, the next normal. Okay, I'm sharing my screen, can everyone see? Every time. Herd immunity. Variants. These are terms that I don't know if we had this slide up two years ago, how many people would be able to pick out a whole lot of them. We've also learned about a, bit, a little bit about technology, which started with sock puppets on the Ellen DeGeneres show a few months into lockdown, then became the first boss who made herself a potato and couldn't seem to figure it out for the rest of the meeting. Even in the American judicial system, there was one lawyer who had to argue, I'm not a cat, but we can proceed with this. And the New York Times went on to say that courts don't usually let cats argue cases, in case the viewers were not aware that that was a stipulation in the judicial system. And I, I have to concede that even, even I have suffered uh, this kind of technological learning curve. There was a meeting that I do like to joke around, but I try to keep it on track. I was not able to remove the filter that shifted from making my head the hoodie with the aviators a giant sparkly donut, and this combination of a Lululemon yoga instructor or 70s tennis pro, both of which reflect a level of fitness that I have not been able to match. So we have learned about technology, but we've, we, we've come a long way in the last year, frankly. And so the focus of my talk today, the crises, the four pandemics plus one health leadership, it's a thought experiment that basically just imagine that you were able to watch the last year of your life as a movie, or you're the lead actor. And you can put your feet up, sit back and enjoy. Maybe I hope you've all got the popcorn. I had uh, Uber Eats to all of your houses. I hope it arrives on time. And so basically you get to watch the last year in real time. And you don't only get to see what you did your interactions and your activities, but you also gain access into their impact. So you'll see the numbers, the number of hours you spent at home, at work, the number of hours you didn't spend in certain places, the number of dollars you spent one way or another, and the outcome data of the metrics that are most important to you by the numbers, as well as watching your impact on the stories of others the other people in your lives, your colleagues, your patients, and your family. For example, that random Tuesday morning where you asked for an extra 10 minutes to do a wellness check with a colleague, and unbeknownst to you, that 10 minutes 
resulted in your colleague who was about to quit his job going home and telling his partner, you know what? My leader was so empathetic and compassionate. I'm, I'm really going to stick with it. I've had a tough day, but I'm going to stick with it. You're also going to be reminded on days where you feel like you really underperformed or you, you weren't up to your usual caliber. You're going to be reminded of all the extra stresses you've been under, under and their impact on you. So your movie also includes the filters according to priorities. So little green circles will emerge as you watch your sustainability impact, photocopies, the long distance travel or not, and the filters according to priority groups. So who's at the center of this movie and who's not? Who's being left out? There's no external judge to this. It's just you when faced with the numbers and the impact. And so at some point in the next week, our challenge is to take 20 minutes and watch your crises leadership as a movie with as much unbiased objectivity as possible. We're going to need to fight past the defensive singular and the overly critical perspective to try to calmly see it from the 30,000 foot view. Which stories and circles would you see? There are four goals for this. Number one is, of course, to get better, to sustain the good, to fix what needs to be fixed, and to invent better, not 10,000 hours of the same. Second, to appreciate those around us. Third, to give yourself a break. You have done great things in the last year, and it has not been easy for anyone. And fourth, this is my part, to commit to action. So to prepare for today, uh, I, in addition to, as Marianne mentioned, our year's worth of ongoing research of leadership in a crisis in various forms, I reached out to the CEOs of all your organizations. And I said, someone from your organization is receiving their CHE and or being recognized for it. And would you please answer one question? What are the top two priorities that health leaders can address in the coming year? And more than half the people responded, which is amazing because they're, they're on quite a tight timeline. Not, uh, not all the best laid plans come six months in advance. And so I was very, very pleased with the response and, uh, and such wonderful answers. <clears throat> Process was not without its imperfections, despite my best efforts. One person responded, would you please let me know who from my organization is receiving their CHE? I suspect it might be me. Well, turns out your suspicions were correct, and I have subsequently removed Tech Wizard from my CV. But regardless, here is what we came up with. So first of all, the number one response, both in terms of which was listed as the top priority and most commonly was people, staff, wellness, mental health, the care of our people in our, in our organizations and the impact of this pandemic on them. This, this photo, I think, really sums up a lot for me. I, it's, I, I just want to take a second to look at that. There are some people who have had tough times. There are some people who have seen it right in front of them, day in, day out, 16-hour shifts, you don't get weekends off sometimes. So this is, of course, this is painted by Josie, but this is the international appreciation. For those of you who are on the front lines or supporting those who are, just one more recognition of all the work you have done for us and for those we love. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So number one priority, how are we going to look after our people? No organization right now is going to survive more than 10 minutes if people are not the focus of what we do next. So what are some of the other related priorities that we heard about? Well, first of all, sustainability, both in terms of vacancies, people who are retiring or quitting, uh, people who need time off because they need extra help. These are all major concerns. And um, <clears throat> Kathy McNeil, one of the fabulous CEOs in our national network says, one of the key tricks here is here is how do we balance the tension between caring for our people, which is number one, 
but also chipping away at the backlog of services that have been paused. And that tension, that's where the magic and the art of leadership right now is really going to hinge. Number two, another thing we need to make sure that we're keeping our workplaces safe and our people safe, that we, as uh, Karen Biggs, another wonderful CEO we know, says that it's really important to make sure that we are developing resilience in our people so that we can follow this pandemic out and also be ready, ready for more. And to make sure, of course, that we are including the, their input in our decisions. Dr. Schleifer-Taylor uh, from London says that as the CEO, the front lines is where I learn what is the impact of my decisions. And I make sure that not only I hear about the impact, but that I factor in their feedback into making those decisions because those are the people who are closest to the care. And then of course we know that we need to make sure that as we plan for succession, as we promote, as we train, that diversity is front and center in our leadership teams and makeups as well. Number two, the tide for number two, equity and diversity, both in terms of in our organizations and patients, communities, families who are accessing our care. So here's, the, I like this photo because at first glance you think, hey, look, yeah, great. We've done virtual care. This is fantastic. And there's a part that is true about that. But how many people have an iPad? And who's left out in this photo? Who's not part of what might immediately to some seem like a fantastic solution? So who isn't in this photo? What else? We need, it's not just a matter of, of talking about it. We need real change, policy changes, both at the organizational level and in terms of government. So how can we rally together and inform government on what needs to be better and what we need in order to do that? Tied for second is addressing the service backlog. This uh, this picture actually always kind of chokes me up. It's... Um, yeah, there, there are women walking around Canada right now who, who, have, who have breast cancer who don't know it because we've, we've paused some of the diagnostic testing and, uh, you know, we, we need to get back as much as we can. And as Kathy says, there's a balance here. You can't just ask people to work 130% of their effort, but at the same time, how do we balance the people who really need our care who have been put on pause? So how do we do that? This is, this is a real trick here. And both in terms of how do we do what we know needs to be done, but also we shouldn't just go back to exactly everything we did before. What are some innovative ways of doing it, either in terms of priorities or new ways of making it better that we have a chance now to think about rather than just doing everything exactly the same as we did before. Another uh, CEO mentioned that funding pressures, I don't know one CEO who doesn't talk about how much spending has gone into this pandemic by the elevated costs of PPE and the extra staffing, the, the books are a mess and it's not gonna continue forever. So how do we anticipate that at some point we're going to need to rein it in and not because of course we've been irresponsible, but this is another factor. How do we do all these things at the same time? The next highest one is how do we sustain the amazing achievements that we have seen that have been remarkable. There was one, one respondent who's actually being recognized for her CE, uh, CHE, but is also the most senior leader at her organization who says, that we've done things that would have taken 10 years and we've done them in a matter of months. That's amazing. And our use of technology, our openness to it, rather than saying, oh, that's, you know, it wouldn't work here. No, no, we've done it. How can we keep that going? I, I just love Chio. I, I don't work there, but I would for sure. It's just amazing. And, and what they've been able to do in terms of virtual care is reminiscent of many healthcare organizations across the country. And so the danger in the resolution stage of a crisis is just the, the back to before syndrome, which doesn't mean we can't do anything we used to be able to do. It means ignoring all the advancements, achievements, and possibilities for innovation just to go back to the way we used to do things. So this, this can't be our way forward. This, then we're in blockbuster video. Like, you know, I, I, wouldn't it be great if we can get back to hard copy DVDs? You know, people can come to the store. No. Hard copy over. Okay. Netflix. This is what we're on to. 
So there's one of my favorite quotes is by a retired U.S. Army general it says, if you think you don't like change, you're going to dislike irrelevance a lot more, which, again, I understand change can be difficult. I'm not making fun of everyone. What I mean, though, is that change is our new normal. This is a, a situation where adaptability is our way forward. And the last one that was highlighted by the CEOs, um, basically, we need to make sure that we're, we've learned from this. This is the whole point of the life as a movie, the pandemic as a movie, is that what are the key lessons that should not, that cannot be forgotten? And not only that we recognize them, that we resource them and incorporate them into our practice and at the highest level into our institutions and, and organizations. The danger right now, before it's all over, is to say, well, okay, we'll look into this once it's all over. No, no, now is the time. And so we need to make sure that we're preparing ourselves for what comes next right now, rather than waiting. And of course, as I've kind of hinted before, that making sure whose voices are involved in these decisions, well, the people we're tasked to serve had better be part of this too, because uh, there's a lot of things they know that really need to be at front and center of our, of our efforts. So the last part here is about system integration that for long-term care is the most obvious example. It was not part of the health system and there were tragedies because of that. And so when we work together and not only within healthcare, but other organizations, how does the education sector, the, the economy, how do we work together as a society with public health to do what's best for our communities on all levels? Because we are not islands of domains, we are really are united. And so what is it that we can do together within our organizations, within our nation and internationally in order to, to achieve this? And so basically communication is front and center, care for older adults and restoring trust. The capabilities that the CEOs have brought forward as being most important, you'll notice that many of them are on the emotional intelligence side of things, resilience, empathy, compassion. And so basically, I just want to finish off here with my last slide. This event, bringing people together, kind of sums up what we do as a college to bring people from across the country together to share research, best practice, and to celebrate the work that you do. And so the last thing I'm going to say is, first of all, to those of you who are graduating, uh, who are being recognized, congratulations. Thank you for your work. And in four words, Yates sums up the relationship between leadership and management. In dreams begins responsibility. So when you're finished watching your pandemic as a movie, your crisis as a movie, that's the dream of what could be better. Now comes the responsibility. So as many CEOs I know like to say, we've thought about it, now let's get it done. So for the sake of Josie and for my commission here, now let's get it done. So without further ado, thank you so much for letting me be part of your special day. It's a real honor for me and I will turn it back over to Monsieur Alain Dusset. Jason, thank you very, very much. Uh, I, I can tell how passionate you are about the work you do and uh, I could tell that you were really feeling uh, some parts of that presentation, and, and I'm sure everybody very much appreciated uh, your preparation and your, your thoughtfulness in your comments. So thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, before we conclude our ceremony for this year, I'd like to add that I hope that your experience um, as graduates of the fellowship and the CHE program has been challenging and rewarding and has helped you grow as leaders. The knowledge you have gained will serve you both well, both personally and professionally as you begin or continue your health leadership journey. There are another 288 CHE candidates currently completing the CHE program, and we have more registering every day and every week. We hope that you will join us at next year's convocation to support the next group of graduates. Please take this opportunity to visit the college's website and sign up for our National Mentorship Program and CHE Mentorship Program to provide these future healthcare leaders with much appreciated guidance. We also encourage you to visit the new Fellowship Select Program website and ask that you consider the pathway to the fellowship as the natural next step in your leadership journey. 
the one part of this uh, whole process that we cannot do virtually is getting you your certificate and your PIN, and these will be mailed to you after today's convocation. We are very pleased to invite all of our new fellows, CHEs, members of the fellows and professional standards councils, members of our board of directors and of our staff to a virtual networking reception immediately following this convocation. The reception will allow new fellows and CHEs to connect with leaders from a variety of disciplines and regions while building your network and creating opportunities for future collaboration. To join this session, please remember you will need to leave this meeting and click on the networking reception link that was shared with you separately by email. Mesdames et Messieurs, merci de votre participation aujourd'hui et félicitations à nos lauréats. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing many of you in the reception in the next two or three minutes. Bon après-midi, good afternoon, everybody.